connect on the socket also. Okay, um, so we've, we, we've seen IPC, uh, we saw that last time. And now we've, we've seen blocking IPC and what, they, what it might mean. So the next step is to uh, go to non-blocking IPC. So why do we need non-blocking IPC? Uh, well, the obvious operation answer is that we can do other things while waiting for the operation. But we have threads, and and uh, the Unix sockets they had both blocking and non-blocking modes. Java got invented; it decided to uh, add a Java layer uh, above the socket, and it said we don't need to worry about this non-blocking stuff, which is complicated to program. People have threads, so let's go and uh, just use threads. And that was the prevailing uh, thought at that time: that if you have um, if you have threads, you don't need non-blocking. Okay, and this was way back before the web really, really caught on. And and so let's go and make this concrete. Again, let's take the grading example that I've been giving many times. So we have this dispatching server, and both 401 and 533 students, let's say, can go and connect to it, but it goes and keeps the two kinds of grading separate. So there are other there are sub servers that go and uh, get traffic, um, uh, get get and each of these servers gets part of the traffic. So this server just dispatches the appropriate uh, grading request to the appropriate server. Okay, and you can, we saw that we can have a hierarchy here also. So um, with threads, what you would do is you've got you've got uh, um, you will probably create one. Um, you will probably create. Uh, you certainly need to keep create separate threads for uh, separate um, ports or channels, okay? And you might even create multiple separate threads for each student so that you can keep uh, each student's work separate also, okay? Um, and 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 uh, um, okay. Sorry, let me let me let me back off here. Um, we we have two two factory channels. Okay, one for the graders and one for the students, both associated with different port numbers. Okay, and now for each of these port uh, server cha server channels, we create separate connections for each client here, and separate connections uh, uh, connections for each client here. Okay, so we in fact have four in this example four different uh, channels in this server, and and one channel here uh, in each of these, and but but two server socket channels. Okay, that's what we have. So if you want to keep the traffic, uh, if you want to not block, you know, if we, if we did not have threads, we'd be forced to go and give an order in which we want to accept, say, um, messages, incoming messages. And we don't know in what order the messages will arrive. So what we do then is we create a separate thread for each of these channels. Each thread waits for, does a wait on its, for traffic on its channel. And, and so you can have concurrency. Okay, that's what you would do with threads, okay? The separate reading thread for each student and greater channel. And threads are expensive compared to method calls. And if you really want scalable servers uh, with lots of traffic, and you know, people didn't imagine the kind of traffic we're getting today, then people have found that you know, threads become really expensive. Okay? So that is why uh, there has been this non-blocking IO is a recent invention, relative recent invention in Java, even though it existed in, uh, in, in, in Unix for a long time. And Unix didn't have support, native support for threads. Okay, so what we might want to do is uh, maybe we can keep. Uh, we might want to just have one thread, or maybe have two threads: one thread for all um, student, for all student clients, and one thread for each grade. Okay. So, so if we do that, um, you know, the question: if we use blocking, then we don't know. Uh, which client port should a client thread do blocking read from, and which grader should a grader thread do block? So, you know, we don't want synchronous operations. We want asynchronous operations, and we don't want, and we already have an asynchronous operation in the form of put, but we don't want, we don't want any blocking at all. 
So we want now non-blocking asynchronous operations. And how do we design them? And, and um, what we'd like to do, um, John Ray mentioned last time that in JavaScript, you can have non-blocking operations. And if you need a result back, a callback is invoked. Okay. If a callback is invoked, then the callback is invoked by a thread other than the one that was used to go and send the data. Because the callback is invoked by some, and we've seen that in, um, in RPC, that each time a method is called, it's called by the system, it's like a callback, and, uh, and some system thread has to execute it. So, um, so we, suppose we don't have multiple threads, okay? or suppose we don't want multiple threads, so then the question becomes, how can we, how can we have non-blocking asynchronous operations? So how can we change our get C synchronous operation to some asynchronous equivalent? And how can we have non-blocking put C operations? So how can we go and um, change our non-blocking, uh, sorry, blocking asynchronous operations to non-blocking operations? That's the question. And, 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 um, and if necessary, we can decompose our operations into multiple operations. So we are going to do what David mentioned earlier. We're going to start doing polling now, okay? And because we don't have callbacks, we're going to do polling because we want to reuse the same thread to get status and completion, uh, the status information and the results. We're going to have that thread poll, okay? So polling is bad, of course, uh, but uh, we, we're going to do polling as an intermediate step towards doing the right thing, okay? So let's go and first do the first step. And then we will do the, uh, no, uh, we'll, we, we'll get the uh, correct, correct efficiency, the efficiency we want later. So let's assume for now polling is fine. And the question becomes, um, how do we go and transform our operation into blocking operations, into, into uh, sorry, non-blocking operations? Okay. And to help us do this, I'm going to distinguish between two kinds of operations. I'm going to distinguish between potentially instantaneous operations. These are operations for, uh, Operations where the start time can sometimes be the same as end time. Okay. And then I'll, uh, I'll, what is not potentially instantaneous is what is long duration. Okay, that means for some operations, for the, these are operations uh, where the start time may not be the same as end time or, or cannot be the same as end time. Okay, uh, so it's guaranteed that it's not the same as end time. There are two different instance, instance there. Let's try to distinguish, let's go and try to understand how the operations we are focusing on map to these two categories. And then we'll figure out what to do uh, with these two categories in terms of polling. Okay. So let's look at these channels and operations that we hopefully understand better now that we've thought about their synchronous and asynchronous nature, <coughs> blocking and non-blocking nature. And let's try to figure out which of these operations are potentially immediate and which are inherently Okay, so I'm going to just summarize what we saw in the discussion. So if there's already a connect message pending at, at the server, then accept doesn't block, okay? If there's already bytes that have been sent uh, on the channel, then the read doesn't block. And typically, as we said, uh, there will be enough space in the system buffer unless, unless you're doing something you know, something really data intensive. So the write may not block also at times. And connect is really, you know, you have to first send a message and then accept response occurs at, so the sending of the message and the uh, uh, receiving of the response cannot occur instantaneously, okay? Uh, even if you assume the speed of light, it's gonna take some time for the data to go at the other end and data to arrive back, okay? So this is inherently, uh, so, so these are potentially these are potentially immediate operations, and this is inherently. So now that we have categorized uh, these two operations, these two categories, let's try to see what we can do to support polling variations of this. Okay, we still need data to be sent, received. We still need accept operation. We still need connect operation, and the question is. How can we um, modify the semantics we have here, which involve blocking, 
we do see that you know these things can complete immediately at times, but they may block. So we want never to block when we're willing to pull. So let's go and put on a system designer hats again and try to figure out what could be the uh, uh, polling alternatives here. And, and uh, um, okay, let's discuss that. And so the idea here is, is invoking thread does not block, but gets desired status and result of operation without blocking. Okay, so that's what we saw earlier. And we can decompose an operation into multiple operations. Okay, and the hint is operations that are long duration would have to be decomposed into multiple operations and operations. So a return channel if connect message pending. Uh, uh, so otherwise return null or, you know, so that's, that's what that accept operation is. Read number of bytes received and it can be zero. And uh, read return number of bytes written to system buffer. It could be zero to length again. Okay. And so I should have put zero to length here also. I don't know why I didn't put it. And return true if connect message can be sent. Okay, that is what, you, you know, if there's only one operation, that's what you would do. Uh, but by the way, this also would need to pull because we might not have space. Now, it depends on the operating system. We can always make sure that there is some space uh, for each, uh, for at least a connect message because that is sent only once. But, but in theory, you may not even have that space, so we can we can make that also have a status information. Okay. Um, and finish connect is when you return true if return message has been received. Okay, so uh, you can imagine both of them being polling, but just as JSON kind seemed to indic indicate, uh, and I, actually I forget at this point whether uh, the operating system does reserve some data for the co initial connect message or not, but but uh, we can we can always have a status information here too, saying whether it, it was successfully able to connect or not. Okay, so uh, so that's that's our polling semantics. Okay, and we've gotten to an important um, part of... Okay, so what happens now is that I've gone and added another operation. I didn't change any of the other signature of other operations. I changed the behavior of the operations, okay, but I didn't change the signature. So I've got the same interface essentially, but um, to allow non-blocking semantics, I also have this finish connect operation. So in fact, uh, the system we are looking at, there's a blocking mode and a non-blocking mode. So if there's a non-blocking mode, these operations do one thing. And if, this block, if, there's, if, then, if, if we are in the uh, blocking mode, they do another thing with the same signature. And in the blocking mode, this operation should make no sense. Or it's a no. So for some operations, start time can be sometimes the same as end time. For these operations, we give status. Uh, so I should have said here, this operation gives status, status information, not operation, indicating if it can be immediately performed or not. Okay. And long duration, we divide that into start and finish operations, and then they indicate if they can be done immediately or not. Okay. Okay. I think we got it right now. So we are reading from uh, reading um, from the from the students. Uh, we have a thread that reads all student channels. So we we pick the next student. Okay, we go and read. They try to read from that student from that student. If it's a full read for that student, we're keeping track of uh, um, how much we read for each student. So this is going to be really tricky programming. Um, if it's not full read, then we go and try to read some more data. And we pick the next student uh, from, uh, so we are just cycling through the students and seeing whether each, any of these student channels has some data. And the moment we get a full read, we go and serve a student read. Okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna take the student request and forward it uh, to, the, to the grading servers and the grading servers. So we're gonna put this in, we are, we are actually uh, gonna put in this in some bonded buffer from which the grading servers go and read data. Um, and then we're going to go and again process the next next read uh, read request. Okay. So like I said, we're going to enqueue write request for grader. And similarly, we're going to do a loop like this. And this picture is easy to show in diagrammatically, but a real pain to implement because we don't know each time. You know, uh, 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 the messages of different students can get 
fragmented, can get scattered, and we have to go and uh, gather them and, and remember uh, which buffer each new piece of, uh, uh, each new message uh, goes into. Okay. So, and here what happens is when we go and read uh, results from a grader, then we go and enqueue a write request for the student. So this is how these two processes are working. And essentially what we're doing, what the steps I talked about, where you're keeping track of, uh, you know, how far we've read it in each student's buffer is really a form of manual context switching that would be done automatically for us if we were to use threads. Okay. And that's why we want to, if we can, have separate threads for each student uh, so that we don't have to go and keep track of um, the various student buffers. Okay. Similarly, with write request, if it's a full write, we go to the next request, and whenever, uh, if, if it's not a full request, uh, right, we go and directly go to the next request. If it's a full write, we go and dequeue the write, and then go to the next request. Okay. Um, accept request, very similar thing. We go, go through and keep checking if our accept can be fulfilled. Uh, and whenever it can be done, then we go and process the request, accept. And connect loop, if we had only one connect operations, we'd do something like this. Uh, we're doing the connect operations again and again. And, but side effect of connect is to, send, you know, is to send a message. We don't really do this. Uh, so the technical term for this is that connect is not item potent. Item potent operation is one that has, this, that, uh, has no side effects. So multiple invocations of an item potent operation is equal to the single invocation with the same argument, if you're giving the same arguments. Okay, so we're going to now have connect with finish connect. So we're going to first go and make sure that our connect finishes. And let's assume that the buffer for the connect is available. Okay, no, no loop required. Okay, which is what I think should happen in a real system. And uh, the finish connect is something uh, that you do with pull. Okay, repeat it with a loop. Okay, and finish connect is item important, so you can do it multiple different times. Okay, so now the challenge is how do we go from these operations to something that allows, and, and so, so uh, the problem here is that we are doing polling, okay, and we don't want to do polling, yet we don't want to have multiple threads. So we want to block, we want to block until there's something, until, until we have something interesting we can do, something pr productive, fruitful we can do. But we don't want to block for a particular operation. Okay. So let me put my pointer option on, pointer on, I forgot to put it on. Okay. So we want to, don't want to block for a particular operation, yet we want to block. We don't want to have this polling, write, read, and except where we often make these calls without doing any productive work. Okay, so how to prevent unfruitful, uh, uh, unfruitful calls without blocking, while not blocking, for a specific I.O. operation, okay? And uh, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say, say here. Uh, okay, I think I started writing something and then I wrote it here. And, but we can have additional blocking and non-blocking non-IO operations. So our, these are IO operations. And uh, uh, we, are, we are going to um, make sure that these operations are not blocked. But we're willing to add some other operations that could be non-blocking, that could be blocking, uh, and, and to augment them so that we achieve this goal okay, and ignore this particular piece of text. Okay. So that's the question. And we have four minutes left, um, but we do need to sort of make up for old time, so uh, for, for, for lost time. So a single thread should be able to wait for selected thread. So this is like the alert function David was talking about. That we, we want we want to know when any of these operations is is is, is executable okay uh, without blocking without uh, being unfruitful and without blocking so 
we want to wait. We want to do a, a blocking alert. And that means we should be able to register with a selected object. This is an object we call a selected object. This is like, like what David was talking about. We want to go and register our interests. And, we, and, and so we want to tell that object, these are, the, these are the channel operation pairs that I'm interested in. Okay, so I'm still allowed to, allowed to do polling on some others. Okay, this is a flexible system. But for these operations and, chan and these channels and these operations on the, these, so for this channel and th this, uh, this operation on this channel, which I'm going to call a selection key, I want to, I want to be blocked till this operation can occur on this operation, uh, on this channel, uh, without blocking, but giving, giving, uh, and, and without being a no-op. Okay. So we go and register these selection keys with the selector object through the details here. So we have a selectable channel, as we saw earlier. We're going to configure it to be blocking or not blocking. I told you earlier that you can configure the, this channel. And um, we can go and invoke a register method with the selectable channel that associates this selectable channel with a selector. This is my initial cut. I'm going to give you a simpler version first, and then I'll give you the more complicated version that I talked about in the previous slide. Okay. So um, when, whenever a register method is invoked on a selectable channel with a selector, you get back this key, key object, okay? uh, which is something you can go and ref, refer to later. And then the selector object uh, you can create by uh, using, using a factory method called open. And then you can invoke the blocking call, which is select. Okay, it blocks till, um, uh, till uh, any of these channels uh, that have been registered associated with it has an uh, has a until at least one of those channels has an operation pending so blocking call waiting until at least one channel is ready for a new event and returns number of enabled operations let's say okay then you can from that get the selection keys as i mentioned showed earlier these are the keys of enabled operations and what we do with the set um we can go and find the channel and then invoke the operation invoke uh, operations we want to on that channel and we can even find out which of the various operations are enabled. Okay, this is my first kit, uh, first cut. And the problem with this is that you know, a right, right operation will typically always be ready. Okay, so you don't just because you want to write to a channel doesn't mean that you want to go and um, uh, be unblocked each time the right um, uh, right is enabled. Okay, you may want to write to sometimes, you may not want to write to other times. And this will unblock each time, every time there is some space in the system bar. So this is what motivates the first design I showed you. So select will unblock whenever right operation is ready, and the right operation is almost always ready. And, there, and, and the right operation is something you, you invoke only when you're trying to fill a buffer. Often you're not trying to invoke the right operation. So you should wait for right readiness only when we have data to write. Okay. So we need equivalent of disabling and enabling of output interrupt processing posting we saw earlier. So this is my final design, which is more cons consistent with this abstract uh, design I showed earlier. We are not registering uh, with a selector. With, we are not associating a channel with just a, a, sele a selector, but also with a bunch of operations. So basically, we are taking these operations and the channels, uh, a bunch of operations and a channel and, and registering the set of a selected set of operations on a particular channel with the selector. So when we're ready to write, we go and uh, make sure that uh, the, the, the selector is waiting for write. And we're not, when we're not ready to write, we'd make sure that the selector is not waiting for writes. Okay. And uh, okay, so we are registering interest and resource operation pair referenced by key ID. So we get back a key for this. So we, we so this I can say selector selection key dot op read. Okay. And I have I ops here, uh, which indicates that you might, this is really a bit mask. So I believe you can have multiple bits set here. Okay, but I'm, I'm simplifying things and assuming there's only one bit. Okay, but I get a single key for all of these, for all, all the bits that are set. And I can, like, like I said, you might want to dynamically uh, uh, write data and stop writing data. So you can change this uh, interest ops dynamically. 
by invoking interest ops operation, which will go and change the set of interest ops. And you get any, at any one time, you can figure out what in ops have been registered okay, with a particular key, which, which are the ops that are enabled in a selection key. That's what this interest ops here is telling you, which one of the many operations that uh, were associated with you are actually ready. Okay. So then you don't have to do is acceptable, is readable, is writable. You can just figure out which operations are, are ready. And there's only, if there's only one operation that you registered, then you don't even have to check that. Okay. So one issue is that here is a, um, here is a system that is, uh, here is, here is a, uh, a thread that's invoked a select call and it's blocking. It's blocking till some uh, operation of interest occurs. And suddenly you've decided that the operations of interest have to change. Okay. Suddenly you realize that you have some data to write. Okay. You have to somehow make it unblock, change the interest ops, and then make it block again. Okay. And that is what this wake up call is. At any time, you can forcibly go and wake up the selector and the thread that's waiting on, on a particular selector and say, hey, uh, wake, uh, whichever thread is blocked here, it should go and unblock. Okay. And so some other thread is, is controlling this. It goes and changes the interest ops and then goes and unblocks the selector thread, which is waiting on the selector which can then now go and uh, block again, but now with a different set of interest ops. And so the criteria for blocking changes. Okay, I've said a lot here. Um, you might have to go and look at this slide multiple times later, but this is like the most important slide in NIO. Okay. So unblock select usually after a new registration, a new registration of, a, of interest ops. Let's go and review what we know. Um, when we looked at blocking I.O., we saw that there was this notion of, uh, actually, when we saw N.I.O., uh, we saw that there was this notion of a selectable channel and server socket channel and socket channel, and then these had uh, links to socket and server socket. And these, these and socket and server socket provide blocking I.O., and N.I.O. provides both blocking and non-blocking I.O., you can configure it, you can configure the channels to be blocking or non-blocking. And, uh, and, and, and they also provided this abstraction of a byte buffer, uh, which kept internal pointers indicating how much is read or written. Okay. And, and where to next write and uh, read. So we saw there were three pointers actually. So that was, um, that was your IO abstraction in its generality. It could be used both blocking and non-blocking in a non-blocking and blocking way. And when you were using it in a non-blocking way, we had to use some additional abstractions. So we saw that. Um, so we, we so here here's where you sort of configure something to be blocking or not blocking. You configure a channel to be one of these two. So here I'm showing you additional operations uh, of selectable channel that are needed uh, in the non-blocking mode. And then we saw that there was notion of a selector. And with the selector, you could register channels and operations. Okay. And whenever you registered a channel, uh, whenever you registered, a ch uh, uh, whenever you bound a selector to a channel, you also indicated the set of operations. And, you could, and that was at start time. You could also change this dynamically. And you, can, you could uh, determine what the interest ops are at any one time. And, the, and these operations were executed in a key that was associated with, uh, that was returned when you registered, when you associated a selector with a selectable channel. Okay, so whenever you do this registration, you got back a selector key that stood for this, for the, for the, the, the things that were bound here, the channel and the operations. Okay, so on that key, you can invoke operations to figure out what channel it was, was the associated one, uh, what operations you, um, you, you have, and you could change the operations dynamically also for the same key. Okay. And a key was returned uh, whenever uh, the select call unblocked. Okay. Um, when the select call unblocked, actually a status value was returned. But after that, you could go and call the selected keys operation to get back the keys. So essentially, selected these keys were returned by returned after the select call completed. Since you can change the interest ops dynamically, 
you might want the select to be reissued. Uh, so you can wake up, the, uh, some, some other thread can wake up the thread that's called select, which can then go and uh, look at the new interest stops and, and block based on that. Okay. So that's, that was how to use uh, the NIO layer. And you can see it's getting complicated. Okay. And while you might need a, need a higher level layer. And one thing I didn't mention last time, that's why I'm saying new here, is how you actually uh, create the selector. So we saw th there was this open method that you could invoke on socket channels and server socket channels to return objects. Uh, ret and and uh, um, similarly, we can invoke uh, factory methods here too. And this is the factory method you invoke. Okay, you take a selection provider class, invoke a static method called provider, and on that you call open selector. And each time you do this, you get a new selector object. Okay, so this is this is what we have, and uh, uh, we can essentially do any form of IPC using these abstractions. Okay, so if I was to go and give you an, uh, an IO assignment, uh, okay, before I go there, so let's go and summarize what we've seen. We saw single event blocking IO. That means each IO operation is blocking and it returns a desired status or result. Okay, it blocks till that happens. Okay. And all operations other than write are synchronous. They block till the operation completes. In the case of write, we block until the data are, are in the kernel bucket. And then we say, we just want to know the data have reached there. After that, we just hope everything goes back. And if you're using TCP IP underneath, if the host doesn't crash, the connection doesn't, the computers don't partition into different networks, it will, it will finish. Then we saw non-blocking IO. We went to this stage where we, uh, we took the same signatures, we took the same operations, but we did not block. Okay. And uh, each of these operations returned something. So that told us whether we got the desired result or, or how much of the desired result you got in case you're writing multiple bytes or, or, or reading multiple bytes. And uh, you, can, you can look at the status to determine whether you should reissue the call. If you're going to reissue call multiple times, then these calls better be item potent. They better not have side effects. And uh, um, actually, I should, I should take that back um, because your read and write will have side effect. So it's only the, so I should take this back. Okay? But you should safely be able to execute this because multiple times without getting unexpected results. Okay, so we saw that uh, uh, the long duration, there was a long duration operation, the connect call. Um, so that was broken into a, a start and finish execution and other operation was simply converted into non-blocking. Okay. And uh, then we went into uh, non and so so we are polling here okay which is not very good um so to avoid polling we went into we use the same operations non blocking io and we did multi event blocking that means we blocked for multiple events one of several events to occur okay so that was the that was a select call that we saw okay and that and to really define what we wanted to block for we needed the registration keys and so forth that we saw in the previous slide So uh, whenever the select call unblocked, we process each enabled key by executing its operation on its channel. So uh, in general, there can be multiple operations with each key. Here, I'm assuming there's only one operation. So you can just go and execute the operations uh, that are enabled uh, when, whenever you get back a key. 